capital O. Yeah, about a week ago. Yeah. She might have been there too. But, uh, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm just coming down the steps. And were you there, were you there talking to the representatives? Or? Uh, I was there for that. It was a local leader's day, mayor's there. But, uh, yeah, we're in Stephen and these. Yeah, professional and oh, yeah. <laughs> my wife points out to the skyline every time she sees it. But you know about it, so always trying to get people to get some time. Well, he did. He I am ready. Good evening. I'd like to first call this meeting of the Mount Vernon City Council to order. And with that call to order, I would ask for, um, well, of course, talk about it, the agenda. Um, Councilman Rose is on his way, and uh, Councilman West has told, told me a long time ago that she's had to be here. So I want to have some of the one target, I guess you could say, in a few minutes. But, um, uh, for well, the you better see if Officer Gurky. Uh, yeah, you better have a ticket. It's not. You better have a ticket this time. Um, agenda, any additions, or can we approve the agenda? No approval of the agenda is presented. Thank you, Paul. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mark. Um, we have a second to approve the agenda as presented. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, communication part of the meeting. Is anyone here to address the City Council on subjects pertaining to today's meeting agenda? Please wait until that item is on the agenda. But if you wish to speak to the Council on item not on the agenda, now is the time to approach the podium and do so. So we'll wait a few minutes. Anybody here? We're working on it there, huh? <laughs> Hearing no communication items at this point, um, I think there will be others that will, in the audience that will be speaking to agenda items coming up. Uh, moving to the consent agenda, we've got four items, two minutes, and licenses, and um, planning and zoning appointment. Any questions about that consent agenda? No questions. I move to approve the consent agenda. Okay. And Paul. Move and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. No sooner did I get the last open spot of planning and zoning field that uh, Matt Siders has a resignation from Parks and Rec. So um, I mentioned. Yes, and I, after after the meeting, we can visit. Okay. The so um, anybody knows of anybody that's interested in planning and zoning uh, representative? Um, oh, Parks and Rec. Oh, sorry, Parks, Parks and Rec. Parks and Rec. Yeah. I'm confused enough for Zoom. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> looking at Kathy Georgia, but no, we've got her squared away there. Um, public hearing <coughs> meeting. Um, I will thank you. And welcome, Councilman Scott. Apologies. No, that's fine. Everybody wants to know if you had a ticket. That's what's uh, <laughs> <laughs> No, you can, tell, skills, you can tell Officer Gerke that I did, in fact, replace my taillights. <laughs> so, <laughs> we're all set on that. <laughs> you know, one of the other pulled over on the back of See? Yeah, see, he was already busy. So. Um, moving on to public hearing. And I'll read this statement. Um, it's officially open to public hearing on the determination of an area of the city to be an economic development in light of the area. And that the rehabilitation, conservation, redevelopment, development, or a combination thereof of such area is necessary in the interest of public health, safety, or welfare of the residents of the city, designating such area as appropriate for urban renewal projects and adopting the amendment number nine to the Mount Vernon Urban Renewal Plan. Which they have the public meeting open. Um, are we waiting for comments? Do you have anything to discuss? Chris, forget about this. Uh, no. Um, this is the amendment that's necessary in order to um, utilize TIF financing for the pool renovations. Um, 
any time that we do a project that is expected to be repaid with dip, it either has to be in the current urban renewal plan or we have to amend the plan. So this is the pool. The last amendment was actually for CHI. So, um, I don't see anything um, outside of this. I'd say it's pretty basic. It's, it's in the hope that we can use to find the pool renovations. Any comments coming to St. Paul about this issue? Matt, we're on E1, the public hearing with regard to what eventually is pool funding. Have you, I know you had a parks <coughs> meeting last week. Any comments about that? No. Commission or from the public? No. There's no one else here in the public to speak to. I will close the public hearing and move to G1. We're ready for that. Um, G1 is a resolution, which I read off earlier. 3-18-2024A. I move resolution 3-18-2024A as presented. Did you call? Do you have a second? Second. <clears throat> Any further questions about that? Otherwise, we'll call a roll call vote. Turner? Marcia. Yes. Ankle? Yes. Anderson? Yes. Rose? Yes. That resolution passes. Moving to resolution 3-18-2024B. Writing for stop sign locations within the city of Mount Vernon. Um, saw several resident comments that you included in the packet, Chief. Um, I don't think there's anybody here to speak to that. Um, I can just kind of overview it if you'd like to, Mayor. Right ahead. We just received a couple complaints about the new uh, Spring Meadows edition traffic driving <coughs> through there. Um, the stop sign at 6th Street, Ashton Place, and Spring Meadow Drive, right where those three uh, streets combine. It's right next to the trailhead um, as well, so there was concerns about pedestrian safety coming around the curves. Uh, we conducted a speed study, which didn't show significant speeds, anything unordinary for a residential area. Um, what I did discover was that there's about 20-some kids that get picked up by a school bus there um, at the trailhead every morning and dropped off. Um, later as well so that was a kind of my bigger driving concern once I saw that they were using that I spoke to the school district um, they're in favor of they had no no issues um, obviously making it a three-way stop intersection um, improves the safety for everybody from there so I think the uh, stop sign will also decrease some of the speeds because they're gonna have to obviously stop to go around further through the neighborhood so I think it'll have a dual impact there as well. So I'd recommend the, the placement of two new stop signs, making that a three-way controlled intersection. Two new stop signs at the same intersection. Um, <coughs> pardon the question from the chief. I took a look at that, and it, it makes complete sense. I mean, if we're gonna, there, there's a high chance of saving life there. So. I sent letters out to everybody in that neighborhood. I've heard zero comments back, so other than the two that initially instigated the conversation. Right. There's only going to be more housing out there as time goes on. Well, if there are no other questions, then I would move to approve resolution 3-18-2024B, providing for a new stop sign uh, in, uh, in the said location. Thank you, Craig. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Scott on that? Move the second to move forward with approval of 318-2024B. And Marsha, that's another roll call vote. Anderson? Yes. Tower? Yes. Rose? Yes. Engel? Yes. The resolution passes. Moving on to 318-2024C. Setting a date for a meeting of the proposition to authorize a loan agreement, issuance of notes to evidence the uh, obligations of the city not to exceed $1 million. And again, we do these one at a time, Chris? You do have to do with one, each one of these one at a time. It is the, the one large borrowing that we've been talking about. Yep. These are maxed out amounts. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have to borrow this uh, amount. Um, for instance, the $2.25 million is the pool. We nice. estimated the $2 million borrowing. So again, these are all max amounts. If we don't put a max amount on there, though, and Say we only borrow two million. 
and it ends up being two with overruns, ends up being two with a quarter. You couldn't just go out and file that extra quarter million. You're gonna find some way to get have it in this resolution. So um, that's the basis by why you see slightly inflated numbers outside of resolution C. Uh, the million dollars is for uh, the water meter change out project. The two and a quarter, which would be the next resolution on D, is for the pool renovations, and then five, which is uh, resolution E. Um, that one point eight is for both Glen Street and the other infrastructure related improvements, of which only one project has been identified. There is a list if you look at it. I had to put in there Fourth Street. Uh, the intersection of uh, the 10th and Summit um, were five different different projects. That doesn't necessarily mean the council's tied into those, but for the purposes of this resolution, I needed to tie them to work that needed to be done. So, so to that point, if in the, in the eventuality that so we've got these five or six things listed. Uh, something else comes up that is a higher priority. If it isn't listed here, can these monies not be used? As long as it's infrastructure. So, so a, a, a road or a, a water main break that, that needs Yeah, what ends up happening is it depends on the, the payback. Okay. So if we use, of that 750, if we use 90% of it um, for streets, then I would look to road use tax or loss to one of those combination thereof to pay that. But if you use it, half of it, say, on water, then I would look to the water uh, fund to repay this one. So it's just more more so on the payback than it is anything. But you couldn't take a portion of that 750 and go and build the park. Gotcha. OK. Question about the timing before we um, <coughs> forward up. On the water meter, um, I know it's a multi-year project. Any chance of it starting at this Calendar year, better. Okay, <laughs> okay. And um, have you have we selected a vendor yet? We have not. We have not. Okay, that's the next step. But let's get the financing first. Yep. Yeah. Set so the date for the public. So the engineer has an has an RFP. Yeah. Um, that changed slightly because we moved away from SRF funding, so we don't necessarily have to do data staking and um, some of the requirements that come along. other direction. Um, but yeah, I hope to select the vendor and have them started by fall. Mm -hmm. Good. Communicate that out to the public because that's... That'll be... I, so the communication will definitely be going out. It's a big thing. They're obviously going to have to come in everybody's home um, to do this. Uh, so once the vendor is selected, it's a turnkey operation. We select the vendor. They're required to send out communication. We'll determine on how they want to do that if we end up going by the quadrants that we've already established or how that looks. But we'll introduce uh, the public uh, <coughs> meetings to the designers so they're well aware of potentially coming to them. And are we looking for the same date? Most likely the April 1 meeting for all three of us, or I believe so. We know the... Yeah, I believe that. Or is there one that's different? No, there's one, uh, the pool might have a different one, maybe it's a 10 or 20. 15th of April. Should be all the 15th. I think all three of them are the 15th of April. Oh, all will be on the 15th of April. Are we just avoiding it for this day? Um, I think we did that to keep it as, so it's all, all yeah. together, but the 2.25 is, for the pool, has a required 10 and 20 instead of a 4 and 20. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. For any other questions or concerns, I would move uh, that we set the public hearing date for resolution 3-18-2024C. Uh, for the April 15th City Council meeting. Thank you, Scott. Is there a second? Mark. Move the second to move forward to April 15th. 
day for um, <coughs> public hearing and um, give us another roll call vote. Yes. Rose. Yes. Trailer. Yes. Yes. Resolution passes. Moving on to 318-2024-D, another date fixing for the pool project 2.25 max. Um, I was already kind of explained it, but any further questions about that component of it? No, uh, we passed final inspection today, so the building permit, uh, the building inspectors were down and signed off on things, so we'll have another meeting on Friday with a uh, walkthrough with the architects for uh, final punch list items. Um, many of the contractors have begun hauling their stuff out, which is nice to see. So, it's good. Excellent. Wonderful. I move approval to pay application number 13 in the amount of $39,609.35. Thank you, Paul. Is there a second? I'll second that. Oh, great. So no further questions of staff. Chief, um, let's vote on approving pay application number 13. Those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Moving on to the next pay application, our change order number 16, Police Station Renovation Project. So we went from 13 to 14 to 16. This is a change order. This is a change order. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the same thing. Right. Yeah. Not, not to confuse you, though, we did skip change order 15 for now, only because we're kind of arguing over the dollar. Right. <laughs> so, the <laughs> question. Good catch. Very good. Well, so, I would move to approve change order number 16, which is moving an existing light pole near to the garage. I'll start with second. 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 Yes. Yes. Um, anything further to add to that, Chief? Other, 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 other no, so this is explanatory. Just so you know what it is, it's the light pole that's on the west parking lot, the public side entrance, right next to the front doors. So um, without this pole, it would have been a little darker. It was borderline in the first place, but um, when they put the driveway in with the steep slope of the retaining wall and everything right there, they tried to cheat it um, as much south as they could to uh, try to keep it as maintainable as possible, which encroached on the current location for that. So we had to move the base, which the city workers did, 
Uh, to replace the entire light pole is going to be over $7,000, so we moved the base and used the same light pole. Um, put it back in, the city guys dug the hole, and, and uh, we got concrete put in for next to nothing, too. So. If you could just push the button and the light should turn green up on top. There you go. Yep. Perfect. Okay. Hello, everybody. I'm Marie DeFries. I'm with the Mount Vernon Area Arts Council and also a member of the Mount Vernon uh, uh, Sculpture Trail Committee. So, two different groups. And um, I just want to say that the other, who the other members are. They are Bob Campana, who's the chair of Parks and Rec and uh, Daniel Charco, who is uh, also a member of the Arts Council and a local business owner. Uh, Katrina Garner is on that committee. Uh, she's a resident of Mount Vernon. And um, Steve Marvis, who's here tonight, um, also a member of the Sculpture Trail Committee and member of the Arts Council. And of course, Matt, we always include Matt in um, all of our communication, so we hope he, hope he reads our emails and is, is informed about what we're doing. Um, I, uh, I think a little background is probably appropriate, just to, it, it's, it's a short history, so it won't take too long. Um, in 2022, both Parks and Rec and the Arts Council started talking about a sculpture trail, and we came together and decided it would be a great partnership. So, in 2023, we came to this, um, to the Council, and um, lo and behold, you thought it was a good idea as well, and granted us $10,000 for the first year. So that would have been last summer. The Arts Council also committed $5,000, and we also got $1,000 from some local residents. So with that money, we installed in August of 2023 four sculptures, and I, I hope you've all seen those and enjoyed them. Um, at the same time, we applied for some money from the state of Iowa, and that arrived last fall. So. We are now in what we call round two. So with that money and some additional money from the Mount Vernon Area Arts Council, we put out an RFP in January. And just last week, um, we met and uh, looked at 27 proposals, <laughs> and really good proposals, and we selected um, um, a sculpture and an artist just last week. And I don't know. If, um, if you've had a chance to see that. But here's, here's what we selected. Thank you, Mary. Yeah. And this is, a, her name is Amy Jacobson. She's an artist um, from the Kansas City area. And, uh, anybody else? So that just happened, very recent. And, um, we're just uh, working on a contract now with Amy. And uh, she has uh, said that she can have this ready for us. Um, it is a commission. It's not an existing piece. The pieces we bought last summer were existing pieces. So we, that was pretty easy. But this one is commissioned. She's done other work similar to this, but this one is um, um, called the Dragon of Pawn Creek. Um, and it's an eight-foot stainless steel dragonfly that's flying through some tall grasses. So um, the, the committee didn't have a, uh, we spent a lot of time on it, but we all in the end agreed that this was, this was appropriate for the trail. So that will be installed by the end of June, and that will be underwritten, as I said, by a grant from, from the state of Iowa, Economic Development, which now houses the um, Iowa Arts Council. And, uh, and our arts council. So that's how that one's being funded. Do you so, mind asking how much that is? So this is going to be 15000 as well. And that's all being funded by the arts council? Well, 10000 from the state art council. Okay. State, and 5000 from the local arts council. 
Got it. Yeah. Thank you, Marty. Um, and I also want to call, call out Eldon Downs and his crew because they, they, they poured the concrete bases for the sculptures last summer and installed them. And so, and it was, it was uh, easy peasy. And I just, uh, I'm still grateful for that. So, just want to give a shout out to Eldon on that one. Um, so, now tonight um, we're here to ask for an additional $10,000 from the city for from the FY25 budget, and that will uh, underwrite what we call our common ground three. So that's how we got from last summer to next summer. Um, and I think you should have, I, I, I sent, or at least in a memo, the sculpture committee sent this memo in November, and it, it does have a case statement included with it. And, um, just to refresh your memory. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, sure is the thing. At any time, Steve or Matt, if you have something that you want to add, jump right in there. But the case statement, you know, lays out a five-year plan. And our, our idea initially was that we would have one sculpture every year. But um, because we bought existing sculptures last year, it worked uh, to our advantage. The sculpture from Colorado um, that was the, the part of the initial group has not arrived yet. Is that correct? Or have I not arrived? Just missed it. Well, <laughs> it's called, I, well, Sorry, that's I'm the one that's right on Main Street. It's called uh, uh, Girl and Hawk, and she, it's a girl. She's running. It's right on, on, on the corner, First Street. Mm -hmm. And then there's the three um, other figures that are behind the girls. Actually, we, we have thought about moving the girl hawk to another location, but that's another story. <laughs> Am I right that the, the singular one is on the north side of Main Street and the other three are in the south? Well, that was our original plan, but then at the last minute we had to put them all on the same side okay. because there was, um, we didn't have a um, we don't have right of way. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Land ownership. And okay. So that is another issue that we'll have to think gotcha. about because we're thinking about the sculpture trail in three sections. Mm -hmm. Nature Park, the section where the current uh, pieces are, and then on the other side of the street. So, um, mm -hmm. so um, that leads me to a concern um, with the placement of these. Nature Park is Nature Park, and it's been Nature Park for as long as I've been in the community. And the thought of installing things in Nature Park um, sort of is contrary to what the concept of Nature Park has always been. So is the plan to actually place art into the park? The current, go ahead, I'd say the current plan that I know it is to continue to place sculptures along the section between first and third. Uh, I think it's called third, right? but not actually go into Nature Park. Uh, there was conversation, there has been conversation about if the uh, west entrance to Nature Park where St. John's Church is, I don't know what street that is, seven, seven. 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 Uh, if that was improved going into the park, that might be a possibility, but that has not been decided on. Yeah, and so again, obviously this would be a council decision, um, but that's been talked about, but also as this continues to grow, we have some issues with land ownership and right away and sewer um, utilities going north on that trail uh, until you get to about the skate park, and that might be a possibility. And going even further north into Elliott Park might be a possibility. But we've also talked about uh, as Bryant Road might be developed into a trail at some point in our inner urban that we could continue this uh, up into that area as well. So there's opportunities more than just this that we're looking at. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I understand your concerns. We do have a concrete trail and some lights in there now. Let's change that scope of that park a little bit. Disc golf course, dog park. Well, but the disc golf course and the dog park are additions to the original quarry nature park. Yeah. So the, 
when I talk about nature park, I talk about the original nature park. Um, the concerns I have is with the the park itself. The park itself, yeah. the old park mm -hmm. part of the park. Yeah. I think something like this would be appropriate in a, as an entrance on seventh uh, within the. Um, in the dog park, maybe there's somebody who wants to make a giant fire. fire. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great, yes. Uh, and, you know, perhaps a few along the trail. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Uh, for me, there's sort of the sanctity of the yeah. original nature park. Um, of course, my biggest concern is that. Um, and it's rather ironic that you're calling it lost trails money. Because when we spend it on art, it's lost to trails. Uh, and the lost funds, uh, local option sales tax funds, were for trails. When this project came forward initially, I spoke out uh, against it, uh, not the concept, but the funding mechanism. I struggle with spending money that's earmarked for trails, and I believe we can improve uh, some existing trails, uh, and I believe there are areas where we should add trails, and every time we spend $10,000, we reduce our budget, which is now what? Roughly. Right. So cash wise that you have in there is about one hundred and eighty-eight thousand. So that's my struggle. Um, and I lost that battle. Um, and once the majority of the council agreed to spend that money on art rather than trails, I supported the art because it is a big project, but I will again speak out against using local option sales tax funding for art along the trails when I believe we should work more toward making our entire community more pedestrian friendly. I support the concept, not the funding, just to be clear. Thank you. I guess I'm just trying to clarify, so we did phase one, phase two seems to be covered by state funding, is that correct? Correct, and local, and local arts council. And the local arts mm -hmm. council. So you're so asking we're a, we're us a for a phase three. three. Pardon? So we're being asked for phase three right now? Yes. Okay. Because you're looking at FY25 funding. Yeah. Okay. So we're just trying to stay ahead of Three. Will there be additional funds from Montmore and Area Arts Council for round three? Yes. Okay. So we're not funding at all? Yes. And um, uh, last time in round one, we did get some funds from some private citizens, and we anticipate <coughs> that, we'll, that we'll probably get some more. So we're just trying to keep it going. Mm -hmm. And as, speaking to the other sections of the trail, that's way down the road. <laughs> And, um, you know, every year it's going to be a different presentation because we just, we never know about the funding, we never, you know, how, how much impetus there, there will be to continue it. But we're hoping to at least get that middle section uh, completed in our lifetime. <laughs> so. Marie, is the middle section the... Well, I call it the middle section, but after for, when you cross first and go through the woodsy area to the skate park. No, that section is, I'm just talking about the section that we've started. Between Nature Park and, and First and Street. Okay. Okay. So, so more art along that yeah. trail? Okay. Yeah. And it's possible that we may move some pieces as time goes on, and that's, it's not, it's, it's doable as long as Eldon stick, sticks with us. <laughs> So we so. call we call that section Petrick Trail. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, you saw Petrick's on the south and, and Sauter Trail is on the north side oh. of first. Okay. Right. Petrick? Mm-hmm. Petrick. 
Yes, Steve. Um, uh, would you? We do have people online, so it's important that we use the microphones. Steve, okay. come on up, please. Yep. Thanks, Steve. This is the microphone. Yes. I, I just wanted to uh, note that we are committed. The uh, current existing. Sculpture Trail Committee is committed to diversity in the pieces, and so the first four pieces were painted metal. This one is going to be a, a stainless steel, and we certainly hope that we'll get some stone and some other materials in there as well. We don't want to have um, onesie, twosie, threesie kind of thing. So. I appreciate that, um, but I will say the sculptures that are there now are I think fabulous, and I really appreciate that. Cool. Um, we would argue that it's brought more people to the trail. Uh, people that had never been on the trail before say they went down there just to look at the sculpture. So that's kind of the part of it, too, is to try to encourage people to use the trail. And, and I, I think Paul's point is, is well taken when we earmark money for something using it for that thing. And while uh, in in a realistic sense, we're writing a check to an arts council, which does seem outside of that trails bucket. Um, the fact that it's it's being used to, in my mind, enhance the trails and uh, theoretically and I think realistically bring more people to the trails is to me the justification for moving forward with the funding uh, and. and I, maybe take a more expansive definition of earmarking things for trails. To my to me it isn't just you know the moving the earth and paving them and, and doing that. It, it can include um, enhancements outside of just the physical trail itself. And so that's where uh, I would fall in that financial conversation. So Chris does it have to come from that the lost source? <laughs> Unless you well, can come up with a very creative. <laughs> 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 so, parks and parks and rec, um, in general, come out of the general fund. Has to be, has to be fire department. That is, that is the location that the <coughs> state kind of puts under attack year in year out. So, if you're asking me, the answer is yes. It's local option sales tax, or there's no funding. So my sort of comparison is we have a local option sales tax. A portion of that is set aside for, is it streets and infrastructure? It's two four categories. You have streets and sidewalks, uh, trails, downtown streetscape, and then the community LBC, basically. OK. So, the equivalent for me is that we take money out of the streets fund to erect um, signage. And so now instead of fixing the pothole on a street, we're putting up signage. Or we're putting up a work of art. We, we use that to pay for our wonderful solar system. And I will not all argue that that's not a wonderful solar system. However, the, the funds were voted for, you know, streets, and, and so that's where I, I'm a, little, I'm a little more in tune to the specifics of what was presented to the voters as use of the funds in each category, um, and I, I, you know, my first experience with this is when we brought forward the local option sales tax for the uh, development, uh, planning development and construction of a community center and fire station, and we purposefully did not account for a percentage to go to either one, um, and I believe that that was the right thing to do when we did that because one became shovel ready before the other 
and um, I believe what we did with the funding at the time was the right thing to do. We spent more on the fire station out of that fund, but left enough in the community center fund to serve as the seed money for what is now the open city. So we, we have to remember that when we put a ballot issue on the ballot in front of the voters, that we are committing to utilize those funds for what we say on that ballot. Chris, you remind me to give the four categories. Streets and sidewalks. Streets and sidewalks. Uh, downtown streetscape. Trails. And mm -hmm. the LBC Community Center. So here's the challenge with the full flop to sales tax. It is a finite amount of money. So the, the sales tax has a sunset. They're only going to collect X amount of dollars um, for each of those categories until 2034. So as I explained to Mark uh, before the meeting, it's like a checking account that doesn't get deposits. Once you spend it, it's gone. So there's truth to the comment that once you spend these funds, they're gone and gone forever. They are. They don't replenish. Um, they replenish year after year. So for instance, Trails gets about 5000 to the total month, about 60000 That's it. Up until 2034, you can do the math and kind of figure out how much is going to come in, into trails. That's one side of, you know, I think what I'm hearing council person to make comments on. And then the second is, it, it, it's all about objective or, you know, how you view something. If we were to, to, to bid out a trail, a project that had benches, lights, art, everything, that would all be considered part of that individual project. You can use local option sales tax for that entire project. It's a little uh, unorthodox to probably look at art outside of actually doing the trail project, but it is along the trail and, and fits that category. So, um, but I don't have, the city does not have funding mechanisms for these types of projects outside of local option sales tax. And you probably, I mean, if you look at the, the trails plan, you have about a tenth of the amount of money uh, necessary to build the trails that you have potentially planned. Re remind me, where did the uh, money come from for the sculpture and the LBC? It came out of the LBC. Which means it came out of Lost. Well, trails and art and sculpture walk um, are tangible uh, are tangible examples of the council and the members of the city of Mount Vernon shaping culture of the community. And um, slightly different direction from what Paul was saying on uh, the voters voted for this money to be used in this way. I think that. Voters also voted for us to be good stewards of helping to shape the culture of this community. And uh, as a result, I think with its close relationship to the trails, uh, currently that the sculpture walk would, in my mind, fall into the category of, of good, good use of lost funds. It's definitely another example of the this is come on you know, um, you've got a variety of artists from a variety of locations, a variety of mediums, as you pointed out. Um, very appropriate as we get to the next topic in our agenda here, which is kind of a film or and monarch butterfly topic. But, um, um, yeah. So is this a point of discussion tonight, or are we looking for a motion, motion. one way or the other? So it's, it's on here for... A possible motion. You don't necessarily have to make a motion yet. This um, year 25 doesn't start until July 1. The little box of sales tax doesn't go away at the end of this year, so it's a little bit different than, than others. Um, 
You could entertain this out of later date if you want. You can make a motion to approve the ten thousand dollar request, and it would just be included in the fiscal year twenty five budget. So. Or at a lesser amount. You can. Yeah. The, the interesting thing here, and I appreciated Marie giving us the history to start with, start this discussion. The first year, um, the city stepped up and paid for a large chunk, as did others. Mm -hmm. The second year, you didn't ask us for anything because you were able to receive it from the Art Council and then a, a state entity, it sounds like. And this year, you're asking, uh, in addition to the Arts Council, for the city to come back again in year three to assist. Right. So we didn't last year, so it's like an everything. Right. Everything so, year. so, and yeah. I would I would say that um, one of the reasons that we received the grant from the state is because they saw that we had initiated the city was a partner. We had initiated the trail. It wasn't like they were just like, oh, they don't even have anything there yet because we. They're had, not fans of the theoretical. Yeah. They like right. the fact that there's already like, oh, planning. It's, it's an it. actual trail, right? <laughs> so I think that that helped. Um, Get the funding from the state, so. For what that's worth. Well, it was worth $10,000, so. I decided to go to Paul on the uh, bottom line, but for a different reason of, the, of, of his discussion, and that is, do we need to go through a budget cycle um, with the changes, legislative changes that been put upon us this budget year before we commit to something that is not potholes. Um, yes, this is so much burden, but um, I mean the counter argument to that is every year the state's going to throw something new at us. So we've now, I mean, you can make that. It, it's a point well taken, but you could make that argument every year. You know, uh, the first year is going to be the easiest to survive. It's the second year and third year. Well. Uh, <coughs> And if I could, um, I, I would be honest with you, I would have just told the Art Council no if there wasn't a designated funding source. So here's the trick with, and this is the hardest thing for me to explain to you citizens. I sit here and look at about 40 different accounts, all with money in them. Some with varying degrees of being able to use them for different aspects of the city. This in particular, Will watch and sales tax can't be transferred to other funds because it was a, a voted effort um, by the populace. So if you were to change or take these portions of Will Watch and Sales Tax and use them in other locations, you would actually have to take it back to the people as a vote. So those four those four segments, those four categories that I listed are set until 2034. And it's one of the other items that I would point out too is, is the money doesn't disappear after 2034. It just stays in those. But it has to continue to be used for those four categories. Even after 2034, you still couldn't just take that money and put it in you know, the general fund if you wanted to. Um, that's not how these work. So of all of the areas, this has the most defined use uh, for funding that we have. So, am I right in thinking that this was just recently reapproved for ten more years, or was it? Am I making that up? Cedar Rapids. Maybe. Cedar Rapids. Okay. All right. So okay. So my well, was a long twenty years ago. Mm -hmm. Okay. So ours yeah. was ten years ago. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So uh, this discussion does. Uh, stirring me an interest in what the Parks and Rec Committee is doing with the trails plan. Uh, with trails? Yeah, I mean we have a trails plan mm -hmm. um, and it'd kind of be nice if we were talking about spending trails money on trails but we haven't had anything brought forward. Yeah, we um, we built two trails recently, which took a lot of that money away. So 
So we're trying to replenish that fund because we don't have other, well, we're doing a barn for the pool and some other things. Yeah, can you remind me of which trail school? Hey, well, one, one that's had a lot of discussions, the interurban going off Bryant Road to the city limits. Uh, there's that hasn't some, been done. Nature Trail, it's like the lion's share of the cash that was on hand. So one of the challenges with local option sales tax is I haven't brought to the council a borrow <coughs> based upon local option sales tax. Um, mainly because that's what I inherited. And so the streets and sidewalks portion of the local option sales tax was spent for leverage before I got here. So, and until 2031, you don't have a streets and sidewalk local option sales tax. It goes for a, a bond payment too, actually, every year. So um, I've avoided writing out to you to leverage those dollars um, against the future. So when we have enough money to do Nature Park, which I think was like 200 some thousand, mm -hmm. um, we waited until uh, the local option sales tax fund had accumulated that much cash and then we bid out the project and so on. And, and I'm in favor of that kind of spending on this. So we types of projects. have the trail that runs along the dog park, we've done the grubbing work. Um, we also have a trail identified that comes back and potentially connects the south and the north with some of the development that's occurring. Okay. Um, You're speaking of Oak Ridge? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we, we have Where segments are that are that are identified now. I would tell you that if Lynn County Conservation came to my office tomorrow and said um, they made a lot of ground on the inner urban and right. that has become a priority, then all of the money from here until 2034 probably gets shifted to right. that connection. Because that's an economic development yeah. tool. So, um, our crystal ball fall is always a little cloudy just because things tend to change uh, quite frequently. But that's kind of where we're sitting. Um, as far as the, the trails plan, some of that's been interact or, uh, enacted by the developments. So mm -hmm. Palisades um, up through Stonebrook, connections back. The, the other trail that was, was put in when trails funding was group. The LBC to the high school, back to Palisades, that connection to the tennis courts. We received a hundred thousand dollar grant. Um, and we spent hundred thousand. Yeah, we spent hundred thousand trails for that. So those are the two two trails that have been done most recently that probably depleted those funds. But um, yeah, I mean, usually when we get to about two hundred thousand, two hundred fifty thousand, then we start to I start to get math the green light to say, okay, the next segment. Can probably be looked at. So it's Spring Meadow, right? Mm -hmm. So that trail was part of the development? Mm -hmm. Okay. Add the stone road. Okay. So the, from, from 17th, just outside of 17th, up Palisades, that will actually go all the way up to 3rd uh, when the yeah. development is done. But that is put in by the developer. In, in Stonebrook, we negotiated instead of parkland being a part of the designation we created out for trails, which we can do through right. the resolution. Yes. Yeah. So once that gets more fully developed, you'll see more trail. There's already one right. that's there, but there'll be more throughout that neighborhood, which will be nice, that we won't have to spend any money on. But it's still a part designated? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. But that was donated by the stoners. It wasn't. That's right. It wasn't uh, part it wasn't of the part of the. Thank you. Yeah. It wasn't yep. part of the part, yeah. part, part of what's currently being developed. Correct. Great. But I can't. So that's, that's an excellent use of that, uh, <coughs> that portion, portion the developers of, portion of the ordinance. Yes. Yeah. Very very good. Excellent. Thank you. What, what's crossing my mind is that um, as we're talking about some of these trails that have been put together for fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. <coughs> that some percent of that cost would go for lighting, would go for cement, would go for leveling equipment, labor, and <coughs> as well. And so if 10% of each trail project would include something set aside for art, a $100,000 trail would have $10,000 for, in this case, a sculpture walk. 
um, on that. And I'm not saying that that's the right number, but it's uh, there's certainly precedent out there when the state of Iowa builds a building, and they'll say, well, one tenth of one percent of this one hundred million dollar building needs to go, include art, and so that, to make sure that, uh, uh, that, that there's sculpture or paintings or art hanging uh, in present. So, can't help but think that. The second thing I was thinking is. Uh, with the in initial 10,000 and the 10,000 that's being requested again for this year, um, are we including or have we included the uh, the labor elements team put into that, or was that on top of it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because that is quantifiable as well, certainly in a per hour basis of materials. And we probably don't want to quantify it. Public yeah. <laughs> reminder. Really and we're very yeah, great. We're we are <laughs> so grateful. That's, really that's, that's not a can of worms. Okay, fair for enough. My, for me, anyway. Yeah. I think they did it on the Nate's got that. Craig, I could, I could uh, uh, agree with you if that was part of the initial uh, planning when, when, you know, 10 years ago when things were laid out, but um, mm -hmm. the, the language was, uh, and the intent at that time, uh, having been involved in that, was pretty clear. Um, you know, that's not to say that the next time uh, we have a local option sales tax and, and whatever council uh, is putting the language together, they don't want to do something like that. But, um, you know, and, and again, I'm not against art on the trails. Um, I, I'm just, uh, I get, I get squeamish when you spend <coughs> money um, sort of out of, uh, but I think there's a really close connection say. between landscaping, for example, and as art and part of a trail project, and a sculpture as art and part of the trail project. Put a tree in, put shrubs in, put flowers in, put art in. To Paul's point, I would be curious what the actual language was that was voted on 10 years ago. The question was pretty simple. Um, each section had a percentage that went with it. And when I say that those categories are those categories, the question wasn't any more comprehensive than that. As far as what was being voted on, sure. here's the challenge with us being 10 years removed from a vote. So there's a lot of discussion when the question is actually uh, put together by the city council. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you could go back in and read the archives of, of the sun and, and get kind of the gist behind um, those items. Then there is the perception of the individuals that are actually voting on it, uh, what they feel like falls into each of those categories. Um, and then there's the city, city council that has 20 years in which to, say, reign over these funds, but to a certain extent, you have control of these funds for a 20 year period. Um, I would tell you that I feel comfortable enough that the trails would come from these dollars. That's, that's not a to me, my recommendation is if you want to do this, this is where the money would come from. Um, and yes, if we were to start a project today, and we wanted to create, include trash receptacles, uh, lights, art, whatever we wanted to put along that landscaping, along that trail, would all be included in one project and that would be paid for from that fund. Yeah, I guess, I guess part of my point in, in mentioning that is when, at least in, in my understanding was, we're sometimes intentionally squishy about the language so that we don't, I mean, I would be, I would, I would argue that we, that, that when, the, when the language was put together at the time, that it wasn't trails and then an inclusive list or an exclusive list of what we meant by trails. It was. So that, right, so that, Ten years from now, if we want to put ten grand of art in and call it trails enhancement, which I honestly believe it is, we can do that because we don't have a list that we point to and says, well, it can only be gravel and dirt moving and paving and 
you know, that's really hard. Yeah. This isn't squishy enough. Most community, <laughs> most communities would say 50% goes to property tax reduction, mm -hmm. and the other 50% goes to capital projects. Right. And, and, and that, now, yeah. here, I think there was, you correct me if I'm wrong, I think there was some identified needs and there was some concern that mm -hmm. future councils may reallocate those funds mm -hmm. if we don't at least mm -hmm. get an individual to put some buckets to those together. terms. Yep. Um, once these run its course and if the state hasn't taken the local option sales tax away from us, mm -hmm. uh, that would be my recommendation. Property tax reduction and capital projects, and it would just be open ended. Well, uh, it was also very specific because it was what the community would support. Yeah. yeah. There was a, I recall a concern that it wouldn't pass if we didn't actually put some parameters or at least yes, a wireframe on it. But you did, outside of them wanting to, to know to you commission art or be prepared for fiscal year 25, you can either make a motion tonight to approve this funding or you can you can wait. Um, we still have until June 30th in this fiscal year. So mm -hmm. you have time if you want to make a decision. But I don't have another location for funding outside of yeah. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> <laughs> was a good discussion. I appreciate it. And I, I was going to just throw in a little bit more background, and that is we did put a survey out last spring. And um, there were 168 responses, which I thought was pretty good because um, Parks and Rec, you know, put it out there, and 168 people responded. And we asked about what did they think of the sculpture trail, and, or, and should it have a theme? You know, we had five or six questions. The fact that 168 people <laughs> answered, I was shocked about. And a, a very small percentage, I can't even remember, maybe Matt does, uh, how many said, well, why, why, why is the city spending money on this? A few people did say that, but most of that 168 were positive and they were excited. And so just throwing that out. Mm -hmm. What is the role of the council on this topic? Um, we've got a couple choices. We can. Um, do nothing at this point. Wait. We can, um, or we can make a motion a second and then uh, put it to a vote of the group public later. Um, pause a second, see if anybody wants to make a motion and move forward or whatever. Hmm. Um, Interpret um, a pause as um, meaning a pause, like in let's wait a quarter or whatever. But uh, I, won't, I won't interpret that. I think eventually, because it's a funding request, you'll have to make some sort of determination. Oh, yeah. Not making a determination tonight is fine. Because, like I said, we're still in fiscal year 25. But at some point, a formal request has been made, and we'll have to. Um, this is. When it's the general fund, I can easily go back to groups and say, I don't have it. Here's going to be, and it gets approved on the overall budget. It's a little bit different because there's a different funding mechanism for this. So um, at some point, I would ask that you make a decision. But it doesn't necessarily have to be done. Yeah, just struggle with it so that I can know what we're going to need. So that's down the road. <coughs> I'd like to see. Our first well, I would, two installations. Yeah, yeah, I would be able to we table this uh, to give council as a whole an opportunity to further look into. A motion by Paul of table. Is there a second table? Do we actually need to table it? Or is um, it is I mean, I don't it's on the agenda. It's easier to, to table it okay. and leave it on the, and then it just goes. Then the it just kind of that way. It's kind of there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I would rather do that. Yeah. Than, I don't want to forget it. It right. goes up into the either. I would uh, second that motion. So it's Paul and Scott to table that motion. Are you clear with that, Marsha? Yeah. Okay. Well, we're um, going to vote on the motion. Um, second it to table the Sculpture Trail, trail funding request this time. Uh, prepare the vote. It's a voice 
vote all in favor of the table, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. So it's tabled for now. June, is that appropriate time for it to be brought up again? Oh, I, mean, I hope before then. Yeah, it's tabled. Well, like I, said, I know you yeah. said in here that she wanted to install by the end of June, so before fiscal year. Well, no, that's, 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 no, that's, that's for the second round. Yeah, we're, we're good with that. Okay. But this is for FY25. So yeah, this is for something we don't have in front of us yet. <clears throat> Got it. Okay, the dragonfly is second round. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's right. And I think it's a wonderful choice. It's awesome. It will, it will stay on your agenda under old business. Until, so be, until you decide yep. to pull it off. Now, yes, I would ask that it not stay on the agenda in perpetuity. Um, that's okay. selfish of me, but that's fair. I second that. <laughs> well, yeah. That would, to your point, that there's no more questions for me, and it would be unfair for the Arts Council to live in that limbo as well. So. Please pass on where we're at to the rest of the council. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the discussion. Yep. Thank, Thank you. Both. Thank you. Next item is discussion consideration of normal May and monarch butterfly plantings. Council action is needed. This is a result of um, last sustainability committee meeting. Um, I mean, Chris had before that sustainability committee meeting. Um, I think a couple other meetings since then. And um, also, uh, planning to complain and zoning, Graham Carl, I think, came up with the um, connection with the um, Monarch Butterfly Pollinator Zone program in Cedar Rapids under Clark McLeod and a member of understanding that with the Monarch Research Project. So I think I'll just stop and turn it over to Gretchen if you want to speak to that topic here. Okay. I have my signage too. Props, all right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You can get signage for free through um, AmeriCorps um, uh, so, um, Good, Good Neighbor Iowa. This says, this says, Freedom Lawn, no lawn weed killers used here, www.goodneighboriowa.org. They're out of the University of Northern Iowa. Um, our rep for um, Green Iowa AmeriCorps, Corey Lewis will provide um, signage for anyone who is considering no mow may or slow mow summer um, so and we just have to decide how we'll get those signs to interested folks but um, i know it's a small sign but you can get there are several versions of of this good neighbor iowa signage that that would tell you that you're you're choosing some other kind of lawn um, other than using weed and feed or or herbicide pesticide that you if you're going to support pollinators the ground um, the yeah the ground pollinators that hibernate the ground hibernators that come out of the of the ground um, late april i mean if we're still operating at a normal <laughs> um, season but Late April, typically May, are the ground hibernators come out, and their um, first food sources are um, they need to eat right away the um, high calorie, and that tends to be the dandelions. Um, the dandelions are kind of like the Big Macs of um, the the food chain, and it's not what you want your pollinators eating all year long. And the dandelions usually don't last all <coughs> all year long, so maybe there's a kind of a yin yin there, but once your um, dandelions go to seed is usually kind of what middle late May and then you can and then you can mow so it's kind of a fuzzy it's fuzzy math but typically you, you don't want to rush and mow the first, last week of April um, because again you're going to disturb the ground hibernators the pollinators it'll be they're waiting to come out and then they're coming out in May um, to find food sources and so you don't want to you don't want to mess with that you want to scare them or, or hurt them um, so you don't mow um, and your neighbors might think that you're you don't care about your property anymore or that you're not um, you don't value your property but it's it's kind of a shift in thinking about um, sort of the broader conservation you have your your little plot your own yards and you can 
mow some of it, and then other parts of your lawn you could um, designate as your um, wildflower pollinator habitat, and it could be, you know, literally just the size of this chair um, starting out, and you could put your signage, you know, there, or you could put your signage on the parts that you mow right on the edge, so people know you do care about your property and um, your property has value. It's just you're kind of shifting the idea of the value of your property toward um, supporting a broader pollinate, pollinator habitat and green spaces. So, so on behalf of Mount Vernon residents who are interested, I'm asking the council to continue NOMO May, the pilot program we started last year, and maybe roll it into an annual event. Um, I don't know what concerns you, the council has heard um, about, about NOMO May from last year. Um, but I hope if we share the concerns, we can find solutions. Um, the slow-mo summer part of this is, you know, completely optional, but you know, a lot of people are interested in learning more about native grasses, native plants, that I guess the Kentucky bluegrass is not, not really a native, so most of the green grass that people are eat, getting or planting is considered, you know, has very short, um, root systems, so it's, it's not really as good for, um, you know, the, uh, you know, <laughs> if you get a, a big downpour, you know, it's going to wash out easier. Um, erosion. Yeah, erosion, thank you. In comparison to the, the native grasses have really long roots, and um, and so they, they're really good for, for erosion. And, um, so, but again, by, by doing no mow may, you're not mowing as much, so you're thinking about, well, how do I want to, you know, what am I going to do to landscape my, my property? What can I do differently? You're not, you know, you're using your mower, you're not either plugging it in or using the gas for it. You don't have the time, you're not investing your time in doing that. And, and for the city, for citywide, um, this other project that, that I think the council will already agreed they would take on this year is with um, Monarch Butterfly Project, um, Re Monarch Research Butterfly <laughs> Project. They have the goofiest name, but they're in Cedar Rapids and they are willing to provide seed for the city. Um, they just need to know uh, a, a set amount of feet that we would designate. And once we get them those measurements, they'll provide seed. I mean, it's almost that easy, I guess. And then we have to hold in a little bit of your, your team to help. But, but the upside is you won't be mowing as much once you get um, uh, prairie, grass, wildflower, habitat uh, in various places. And uh, speaking of the trails, since there was all that grubbing going on over along that trail, I can't remember the name of it now. Petrick? Petrick, is that after somebody's yeah, name? Yeah, the there? Petrick family owned that name. Okay, yeah. how do you spell that? P-E-T-R-I-C-K. Okay, Petrick's. Council member. Well, that area is very um, beautiful. I walk it every day with um, different dog, my dog and other dogs. Um, and so we love it that it's, it's got all of the nature there. Um, and so that area that was grubbed, we're hoping um, to put in some native seeds um, for planting in that area so we can get some more. Because um, right now it looks really bare. <laughs> but um, but we'll, get, we'll get some growth back in there and it'll be really beautiful. I don't know if any, have you guys gone through there yet? Seen the grubbing? Well, it, and, and also along First Street. Um, the slope down, not Petrick, but Sauter. Sauter, mm -hmm. okay. We're talking about the robot that mm -hmm. you put in there. Yes. And the pictures you yeah. yeah, that's an amazing <laughs> machine. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, so that side, um, First Street, before you, before you get to the V, um, is bare too, so you can see the trail. Both ways, you can you can see a lot more. It used to be more like walking the trail, as you felt kind of like 
hidden, a little more hidden. But, um, Matt, has uh, Parks and Rec or in conjunction with Public Works or have, have locations for <coughs> the Monarch Pollinator Project been identified? We've yes. identified a few, okay, but we also haven't communicated with um, Public Works on those or who's going to do the work to prepare right. those. So we have not had those discussions, so yeah. I think the conversation has warped just a little bit. So we have um, Daryl is is actually working on some seed mixes for us <coughs> under the Monarch um, project, and then part of this seeding where we did some of that work. They're different seed mixes. Um, so some of the items that council needs to be aware of on No Mo May. Um, we don't really have that in our ordinance. Basically, staff just suspended uh, enforcement of, of nuisances during the month of May. Uh, the only complaints that I would say that we really received last year were um, there were a couple of residents that were probably slow to the punch uh, to mow after after the end of May. Um, but other than that, I don't remember receiving a, a ton of complaints from that. The second is the possibility of, of the council having to change ordinances. And um, most of the, the prairies uh, survive, not necessarily with an annual burn, but they do uh, do much better with at least some sort of burning that, that occurs. Um, from the city's perspective, uh, I would reach out to the fire department and use these as training exercises for those that live near them. Um, it will be a matter of educating them to make sure that they keep their windows closed when this is occurring because it is thick, it is black, and it does ignite and, and burn rather quickly. Um, and Darryl, like I said, is working on some very steep mixes. So along the, the Sauter and Peter Trail, that's kind of a, a forest mix. Um, and she showed me the thousand seed variations that you could have with each of these mixes, but um, we're relying on them on the expertise as far as the seed mix is concerned. Uh, as far as the, the project that we have, we've talked about some places in Nature Park. We've also identified the front part of the front section of the, the police department. There's a wide swath of green. My comment back to them is if it takes away a, a a mowing position into the summer, then I'm happy. That means we're mowing less, less property. So um, within the subdivisions, there's possibilities there too, but we won't see those for another four or five years just because we won't maintain or get ownership of those properties until then. But yeah, I think we've got a lot of places. Just considerations for the council is obviously if anybody came and, and complained at a city council meeting about nobody or somebody not mowing their lawn, formal recognition of no more may means the staff is going to do exactly what we did last year and take a tempered approach mm -hmm. um, to enforcement and then know that at some point in the future you're going to be talking about some ordinance changes to allow for these natural prairies to be burned. And, and with that be prepared for the people who have breathing um, complications to come forward in opposition of that because that is why the council uh, changed the burn ordinances in the past um, to eliminate them within certain criteria. You have to get approval of neighbors within a certain distance, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah. it's a double-edged sword. Uh, just be aware of that. To be fair, when I was a kid here, you could just read <coughs> leaves into the gutter and light them on fire. So I mean, was, we kind of swung wildly from one <coughs> side to the other. Yeah, and they used to use asbestos in the building. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Advancement is a good thing. Yeah. And lead in paint. <laughs> I do believe there's there's room to look at that ordinance. But again, um, all the people in that door for the city, others are going to ask if this is And um, I'd say it was a far cry from having our fire department yeah. burn specified areas versus somebody who's raking their leaves. And burning 
in September, October, and November versus two hours on one day. So we would still have to pick pick our times. Uh, we wouldn't want to do it. Not everybody's wanting to open their windows and like that or run the air conditioner too. Um, but I think the takeaway here is if you're in support of no more May, that's I just kind of need a head nod tonight, and then as far as the uh, plantings, I think we're going to plant regardless. We could always mow um, prairies down and not necessarily burn them. But the problem with that is the uh, burning tends to help take care of the noxious weeds. <laughs> noxious weeds. Um, so. So you're not looking for a motion or anything like that, just basically. Uh, no, I didn't ask you for a formal motion last night or last last year. I'd be in favor of continuing this uh, experiment that we started a year ago. Agree. Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. I, I agree. Just you know, be mindful. You know, I think if we talk about one of the little buffer zone, you know, two buffer zone between you and your neighbors, I think that'd be that'd go a long ways too. Just so that it's an acknowledgement that they see that you, you're thinking about them too. And, you know, the educational component besides the signs, I encourage um, connection with the sun and also um, um, the presence of festivals if you can. You know, if you need a method anyway to hand out the, the signage, uh, mm -hmm. unless you got one set up already, but uh, for uh, educational community, um, I would mm -hmm. mention that. Um, I know Chris has met with three or four people from that committee about what designated areas for the city properties to put less mold left. That happened a couple weeks ago. And um, in this, this same general area, I'm going to include, um, I, I read up some B-City B USA, so that's a uh, um, $100 investment that the city has to, um, to, to uh, follow through that commitment. you have enough direction there, Chris? I do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the uh, special consideration of Cottonwood Apartment site plan. That's how much it is needed. So I included separately um, the Planning Commission uh, report. They voted in favor of approving the site plan uh, with the conditions in that report. Basically, they have some items that they need to fulfill. And the planning commission is recommending approval as long as they fulfill those those items. Um, this is a 30-unit complex. Will be on the south side of Glen Street as extended to the east. Um, Glen Street would be constructed, and then north south access to business 30 would also be extended with that. So. I attended the planning and zoning meeting that um, they had last week and uh, met um, both uh, Chris Nolgan, I think, and then Nick Vettis was from the um, construction company, I think. But Chris from CHI, Community, Community Housing Initiative, offered to be at this meeting in any in one form or another. And I, I told her that she didn't need to, so don't, pers don't uh, uh, perceive her lack of absence, you know, lack of attendance here being a uh, lack of interest. In fact, she spoke very positively about. Um, Initiative that maybe back to Mayor Paul's era with the uh, REM housing. Uh, yes. that, that, that was something that they were uh, very positively impacted by uh, with their organization. And my heart has that um, star of our name there. So. Mm -hmm. Very classy building. Has three different uh, design elements to it. Um, I think it'll be a nice addition. And obviously, it fills in a niche being a senior or moderate income complex. Being able to point to this from all the housing commission people that are wondering what the, what we're doing anything here, um, to see actually see actually something happen. And the second thing is that uh, it, it opens up an area of town that hasn't had any development. Um, I mean it's Cornfield right now, but you know there may be other opportunities in that area. Uh, once we get this establishment, we get the the two streets connected and so on. Up here. Yeah. I would move approval of the Cottonwood Apartment site plan as presented. Thank you, Paul. Is there a second? Second. Okay. 
We have a second to move forward because we've got no other part of the site plan. Any questions? Lee is here. Also, if there's any questions of her, of her, of Chris, yeah. Good. Nice Good. job. Yeah. Four years to get us to this point? Well, a little over. Eldon's crew may be a point of contact. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Are you off the hook on those shoulders? I will say that he's been itching to use that power screen again. <laughs> this might be a little bit more than that. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Motion on the floor. Yeah. Right, we need to vote on. Uh, moving forward with the Conway Department's site plan. All favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries. Big vote there. Discussion consideration of change order 17 on the police station renovation project. As I said in my, in my report in the uh, prior times, I get to tell you you're getting money back. This is a credit of $1,100. I would move approval. Renovations in amount of a credit of $1,100. I'll spend it all in one place. I'll take Paul's He's sorry, I spent it. It's already gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had to reread re this a couple times and pass my cup on the chief chef for that. Um, Walsh is going to pop out. Change order to the positive. Stick breaks. Who is second to move forward with the change order number 17 on the police station? All in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Discussion and consideration of a bond console engagement letter with Harris Cooney for the general obligation of capital loan notes, series 2024. Council action as needed. This is uh, estimated to be about twenty-one thousand seven hundred, just to be incorporated in the bond proceeds. Um, not bad considering we're borrowing north of four and a half to five million dollars. There's other filings that this has to deal with as far as uh, new lending requirements. Um, so. With that, we use dollars for all of our other borrowings since they've been here and have been happy with their work. Any questions or ready for motion? I move approval of uh, the engagement letter with dollars and two. Paul, oh, second. 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 Paul, Mark. Move second to the floor for the um, bond council letter with uh, English Cooney. No further questions. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Last item here is special consideration of operation and maintenance assistance agreement. Careful Aquatic Resources. This is in the amount of $19,125. This is a normal expense that we have yearly. It's um, chemical that goes in the pool and then they provide um, expertise uh, when we need it. Has it changed much in the three years that they've worked with us? I mean, it's gone. Just uh, normal. Chemical prices have gone up. Normal. Yeah. Okay. Any question, Matt? Anything you want to add, Matt? Anything you want to add? Okay. It's, it's just a one-year deal. Cost of deal business. All cost of business. <laughs> Is it a one-year deal in, in, with the intention? Yeah, it's always a one-year deal. Okay. Right? They can They'll never lock in chlorine. Um, so I would move to approve uh, the pool maintenance contract for the chemicals in the company Carico. 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 All in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, reports. Police report. Chief Shannon. Thank you, Mayor. The uh, only additions I have beyond the report you have is we, as we prepare to quickly end, hopefully, the construction project um, and get things cleaned up and ready for you guys. We are planning, I've been talking with Chris a little bit, trying to do a uh, probably a council meeting starting there and then moving back up here. Um, first part of April. I don't know if it'll be the first meeting or the second meeting. We'll get that ironed out as soon as they're out of the building. Um, but I will also be inviting Elizabeth Council um, for that as well. So it'll be a joint start probably for that, just to take a council tour, in-depth kind of council tour of the facility, see what we've done, see what you've accomplished uh, from that standpoint, and let you ask questions and kind of walk through the use of that and get a good understanding of where it's at. 
And then we're trying to identify also a public open house, a full um, open house either during police week or possibly um, heritage days um, to let the community come in and check things out as well and uh, see what's, it's, it's looking pretty amazing and it's gonna be really good when it's done. So other than that, that's all I've got unless you got questions. Post the meeting agenda for that meeting when that happens should reflect. It will, absolutely. Yep. We'll have to do the same thing with we'll Lisbon. actually be before your meeting. Uh, we have public hearing request that we've already set. So for each of the meetings in April. So uh, this open house will happen. We have the first or the 15th, but we have one that starts at 6. The first. First. So we have, with the new law changes on property tax, we have filed public hearing things that will happen. So probably the 15th. Um, and it'll probably happen before the council member will have to be back here, obviously, by 6.30 because we have public hearings that we've already put in notification. So, but yes, there will be agenda for me. Yeah. Maybe we can get a police escort until we get here on time. <laughs> <laughs> I can pick you up, Scott. Yeah. So that's how we're playing it <laughs> <laughs> We're still in budget conversations. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Here. But it's right. That's right. <laughs> Public works. Questions of Mr. Downs. Thanks for the tutorial. Um, Do we own that robot? No, no, it was a rental. It was a rental. Um, that thing will eat anything. <laughs> it's pretty unique, and it's really nice to have, especially if we're doing anything close to like a water's edge or uh, steep slopes, that sort of thing. So, um, yeah, it does a great job. You don't want to see the price. <laughs> well, we've hired goats in the past. <laughs> <laughs> I believe. <laughs> Nothing else in public works. How about Parks and Rec, Mr. Sayers? Nothing to add. I was gonna. I was gonna add one thing. I oh, guess. Uh, oh. That's okay. Um. Uh, usually, usually uh, the one thing I didn't add because. I didn't know it when I, well, I guess I did. I kind of forgot about it, but uh, I know potholing is a big thing right now. Uh, we got a lot of spots in town that, that need some attention. Uh, normally, uh, LL Towing provides that material for us and they don't usually get out until it warms up enough. Uh, they did get some batching done and we did get a couple loads, but I just haven't had a chance to get out there yet with the guys. Um, with spring break going on, I had a few guys going and we're down one guy. Um, as you know, uh, we lost one of our staff members. Um, and I was off myself for a little bit of time for some personal issues. Uh, so we're kind of getting back on track with spring and we do have material and we will start addressing uh, some of those street potholes. Um, but yeah, no problem, man. Thank you, Ellen. Sure, we'll get to it when you can. Anything else from Public Works or Parks and Rec? <coughs> um, Cole Library, Doug Grace's report. Ashton is always up there. And any reports, strategic plans, and presentation from the ambulance service? All right. Yeah. We have multi. Jake, so uh, Jake, Jake, Jake. so I, I've asked, so first of all, Jacob Lindauer with the Lisbon Hopper and Ambulance Service. Uh, I just want to say that I've asked both cities to be on a short meeting, a short agenda. Um, that does not happen. So, um, but it's been great discussion both times. So uh, what I wanted to do tonight is just take the opportunity to get in front of you a little bit more. Um, normally I submit a written report which doesn't necessarily give a ton of opportunity for back and forth, which is what I love. Um, anybody that's gotten cornered by me at the grocery store or anything like that, I can talk EMS all night if you want to be here. Um, <laughs> but I do encourage some back and forth and ask questions as, as you have them. Um, but overall, what we kind of do is we take care of Lisbon and Mount Vernon. Um, we're a lot of people's first contact with healthcare in an emergency setting. Uh, we currently operate two fully equipped ambulances at the critical care level, um, 
critical care capability, I should say. We are um, technically an EMT level minimum staffing with the uh, option to flex up to critical care, uh, which is the highest certification level within the state of Iowa. <clears throat> and we have been taking calls since 1974, although we were established in 1973. And last year, so we responded to 992 requests for service. Uh, we did have um, somewhere around 1,015 requests. So the, the re turned down requests would be things like interfacility transfers or calls that occurred in our district when we physically didn't have an ambulance available um, in, that, in last year's case because of lack of units. Um, so our mission, as always, is we want to make sure that we're providing the best care possible for our communities as well as the surrounding areas. Uh, because at the end of the day, um, you know, Lisbon and Mount Vernon are our heart, uh, but we do need to be mindful of our neighbors as well. Um, and our vision is, you know, for lack of better words, and to sum that up, is to be the best. Uh, we, we firmly believe in the education, providing high quality care. So again, a little bit of information about us. Um, we obtained 501c3 status in 2018. Um, ultimately, our, our direction comes from all of you. We do appoint our board of directors, um, four from each city, as well as one volunteer representative. And you can see our, our current board of directors up there at this time. Uh, a little bit about our, our organization. Um, so our medical director is Dr. Tony Carter, who works with Unity Point. Uh, he actually used to be a member of the ambulance service while he attended Cornell College, so he has a little bit of an intimate relationship with us. Uh, he firmly believes in our mission and vision for, for the future of the service and has been a great asset to the, serve, to the ambulance, so we're very fortunate to have him. So, like I said, Dr. Carter is our medical director. Uh, currently, when we look at our staffing, we have 31 paid on call or volunteer members, two part-time paramedics, and myself as a full-time member to manage all of those calls and all of the, the scheduling polls. You can see our residents. Uh, primarily, we're very heavy on the Mount Vernon side right now between the city and Cornell, uh, as well as, as our Lisbon and out-of-town members that are tied, and then a pretty good variety of, of certifications. We're very happy with our advanced EMTs. Um, over the last two years, the state has really given us a lot of freedom with that advanced EMT level, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we start talking about our flex staffing model and, and things of that nature. So some of our activity from 2023. So 992 dispatches. Of that, we transported 696 times. Uh, the non-transports can be anything from standbys, cancellations, um, patient refusals. So we go, we evaluate. Fairly common with low, low speed car accidents where we may go and we may have two, three, four people that were involved in the accident and are requesting some form of medical evaluation. Um, and so that all plays, plays into our numbers. When we start looking at our, our response times, that's where we start tracking uh, a lot of our metrics. It's kind of the first metric we track. Uh, our goal is to be en route on an average of seven minutes um, from the time of call. Uh, we, do have, we do track our 90% time, which nine minutes is a little higher than what I would like. I would like that to be a little bit closer to our, our median. Uh, the problem is, is we have days where we're out the door in about a minute and a half because everybody's hanging out at the station and then we have days where uh, people are coming from home, maybe it's going to be a delayed response due to weather. So that's going to be the big impact between our, our median and our 9%. And you can kind of see our breakdown between primary unit responses, our backup unit responses, which just continually in increase. Uh, we had four instances where we could have utilized a third ambulance. Uh, paramedic intercepts, which would be where we go and jump in with somebody else's ambulance to provide a paramedic level of care. Transfer crews, that's going to be specifically for transfers from one hospital uh, to another facility, whether that be another hospital, uh, back to the, the care center, uh, anything like that. And then standby crews would be for typically football games, whether that be Mount Vernon, Lisbon, Cornell, uh, or other activities such as the rodeo uh, down in Southland. You can kind of see our, our call breakdown over the last three years. So Mount Vernon is fairly consistently the, the bulk of the call folder, uh, with Lisbon following closely behind. 
And we've seen actually a fair amount of growth with the other category, uh, specifically starting uh, around 2020 when we started providing interfacility transports from Anamosa uh, to other facilities just to back up their service while they were going through a staffing shortage. So our revenues. This, this graphic is a little bit skewed. We did receive a trust uh, during fiscal year 23, which offsets this. Um, so our, our total revenue is typically between uh, about 350 to 400,000 a year uh, on average. So you can see the bulk of that is going to be for ambulance billing. So that's going to be our, our bills to insurance, Medicare, Medicaid, um, bringing the bulk of the service, followed by grant or uh, sorry donations, which usually makes up between 35 to 60,000, depending on the scope of the project, what we're asking for, and different um, projects that we may look to get sponsored. And then city funding, uh, as you guys have known over the last two years, has, has increased to help provide additional funding for staff positions. If I'm understanding correctly, that 32% <coughs> is skewed this year because of that? Yep. Okay, so that's yep. a higher percentage. Yep, so that's a little bit higher percentage. Thank you. So, but it's, it's typically right around um, that 15 to 20 percent mark. So, Jake, looking east down 30, how are those communities dealing with ambulance services? I mean, I think you're probably covered to the north with Anamosa and the strength of their hospital, mm -hmm. to the west with the Cedar Rapids hospitals and south of the uh, city hospitals. But, yeah, so when we look at, um, so one of the biggest parts of building an EMS system or your system development is looking at patient flows. And actually along that Highway 30 corridor, the majority of patients are actually flowing to Cedar Rapids or to Iowa City. Um, very few go up to Jones Regional and Anamosa, primarily due to capabilities. Uh, <coughs> it's, it's a great facility for stabilization and for, for basic treatment. However, if you require any additional services, so intensive care, cardiology, um, most surgeries, anything like that, they're going to have to facilitate transfer to Cedar Rapids, Iowa City, Dubuque, um, Waterloo, Des Moines, uh, wherever there's beds available. So, so actually we receive a lot of the patient flow coming through Mount Vernon on Highway 30. Does that answer your question? I, um, those communities' ability to staff input services is what, as part of the question as much as anything, um, are you getting pulled out farther and farther uh, from your base territory yeah. to the east? So, so over the last three years we've seen a high use, we've become kind of that consistent friend. Um, while others have dealt with maybe intermittent staffing, intermittent availability of those ALS resources, we've really been kind of that tried and true resource. So we have our, our core that we work with, I mean, almost weekly, which would be Mechanicsville and Stanwood. Um, you know, we've built great relationships. There's a lot of back and forth. Uh, there's been, the, you know, we've received services from Mechanicsville. They're our quickest mutual aid resource, but we do provide them a lot of paramedic support. Currently, between the two agencies, they have one paramedic on staff or on, on their roster, um, which if anybody knows is Lonnie Cope, who's been around for a lot of years. I'm not going to guess because I'll get in trouble. Uh, but we do a lot of sh shared and joint training. So we've really built a system. Um, they've recently, over the last year, approved the essential service legislation. So they're currently working through the process of developing a county ambulance. So unlike with Jones County, who passed uh, the essential service legislation two years ago, we actually receive a portion of that for the services we provide to Jones County. That's not going to be the case with Cedar County because they're going to divert all of those funds into one centralized uh, ambulance service. And they're still working through what that's going to look like. I don't anticipate any changes for the next year or two, um, but I also don't know enough um, with some of the plans discussed to say, um, you know, what the final endpoint is for them. So, does that help? Yeah. Okay. Um, but as far as ambulance response, they're fairly consistent. Um, they can get a BLS, or so a basic life support ambulance out the door. Uh, they actually have trained to advanced EMTs, so we work with them to kind of get them working on protocols that are similar to ours. So now we can go and jump in and be like, you know, understand where they're at in the protocols and their, their treatments and help continue care for that patient. So. You just answered one of my questions um, on slide 12, I know you're getting there. 
You said BLS means basic life support, ALS yes. means what? Advanced life support. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm sure they, I knew that at one point, but I'd forgotten. So. There used to be an ILS, which I still like to use, which is intermediate life support, which would be the, the advanced EMT, but I can trouble <laughs> it. So. Um, expenses, so the bulk of uh, our expenses does come from staffing, so that would include myself part-time as well as the, the stipends paid out to the paid on call members, the volunteer members. Um, and that also includes kind of the, the fringe benefits, so the training stipends, um, everybody receives X amount of money to, to continue their training every year, as well as um, license renewals, all of that piece is, is kind of enveloped in the staffing. Administrative support, insurance, patient supplies. Uh, we've had some really good success that although patient supply are increasing, we've found or been able to diversify our, our suppliers to where we're able to get some pretty good sales and deals on equipment as well as approaching um, our equipment rotation a little bit differently, uh, which was actually a big or in big part due to the COVID 19 pandemic. Um, you know, when all of a sudden you can't get something that's really important for nine months, you learn how to, uh, to rotate your stock and make sure that you have enough on hand to, to get you through a shortage. So, and then vehicle maintenance. <clears throat> so this is the question I get all the time. You send a bill. Why can't you be self-sustaining? Why do we have to come to you and ask for help? Well, because we're an industry where we can charge whatever we want. I can put whatever numbers up there for our rates. Um, and for about 70% of our customers, our patients, um, it doesn't matter. They're going to, going to approve a rate that they're going to reimburse us, and that's what we're going to take. Uh, so your Medicare rates, you can see what's going to be approved. And then take another 20% of that roughly, and, and that 20% is the patient responsibility. So there's one of three things that can happen. They have secondary insurance, and the secondary insurance picks up that, that remaining 20%. Uh, the other piece is the patient pays that 20%, or doesn't pay that 20%. Or the third case is they're actually dual Medicare and Medicaid, and that 20% has to get written off. Um, and then the same thing with Iowa Medicaid. Uh, that is our typical recovery, and that's, that's where the buck stops. So when we look at our average cost per call, with cost of readiness and basically everything but depreciation factored in, our average cost per call is about four hundred ninety-one dollars. So your average loss per call or average cost? cost. Oh. Typical bill is thirteen twenty-four, but the but, but our cost is four. What did you say again? Four ninety-one. So that's before we factor in depreciation. Um, okay. And what that unfortunately is making up for is when you look at any healthcare billing, what we're making up for is either the the bill is not paid. The Medicaid rates, or you know, we're fortunate that our overhead, our staffing costs are low enough um, that with Medicare, we are making that back to help supplement some of our other um, losses. So it's it's unfortunately a game that we have to play in healthcare, and that's where we could do a whole one-hour talk on the, the triangle of EMS being public safety, healthcare, and public health. Um, two of the three are subsidized, and the other one is business. So where does EMS fall on that? Uh, a lot of people are asking that question right now. So, so when we look at our, our planning, uh, we really didn't have a capital plan in place until about after 2020. So we didn't really have funds set up to purchase ambulances, equipment that we knew we were going to age out. Uh, thankfully, our, our board, um, a lot, you know, largely under the direction of, of Chief Shannon, along with the current members at the time, um, around the 2017-18 time frame, really started to look at where are we now, where do we need to be, and what's our equipment going to look like. Um, you know, that was basically my first project hitting the door. And thankfully, we've got to the point where we kind of have an idea of when is this equipment going to age out, how are we going to focus our grant funding, where are we going to apply grant funds, and where do we need to be setting aside money to, to make these purchases happen. So we're not coming to you every five years saying, I need $300,000 for an ambulance. Um, with that, uh, in this fiscal year, we have pre approved $340,000 worth of vehicle purchases. So we're going to be purchasing an ambulance at $270,000, as well as a, a replacement SUV at approximately, um, what, $70,000? Uh, so, we're fortunate that through grant funding and set-asides, we have that funding ready to go. 
Um, it's actually going to get us a lower price on the chassis moving forward, so we were able to save some funding that way. And then over the next seven years, uh, we're really going to turn our focus to space needs. What's that going to look like and what is that project going to be? What is it going to, going to look like for us, for the cities, for the, the community? Um, and how are we going to achieve those spaces in the most efficient way possible? And then finally, uh, we're always looking at becoming a consistent resource. There's a huge shortage of EMS providers right now. We're taking different approaches, whether that be our cadet program to try to steer uh, high school students into healthcare, EMS uh, as a career, um, looking at potential partnerships with different organizations on how can we share some of that funding to have ALS providers staffed in town ready to go um, and be available because again, we, we really are that first medical contact, that entry into the healthcare system for a lot of the community. Some of the initiatives that ultimately grew into our strategic plan. So back in 2021, maybe, we were, um, the council agreed to donate a retired SUV uh, from the police department to the ambulance service as a proof of concept. What this allowed us to prove is that we would in fact use an SUV. We can be more efficient in our responses, whether that be to paramedic intercepts where we don't have to take an ambulance out of service, or community calls where we can get advanced level providers there quicker and to the correct calls. Uh, so currently, our model is we are trying to get to the point where we are full-time staffing a paramedic in the SUV, as well as our ambulance at either an EMT or advanced EMT level. So what would happen is the paramedic is able to take the SUV home as a take-home car, on-call car. So instead of wasting the time to respond to the station and then to the scene, they're able to go directly to the scene. Or days that I'm in the office, now instead of waiting for the full crew to get to the office and then to go to the call, if it's a high acuity call, I can now respond directly to the emergency, start providing that care, do an evaluation, and then, depending on the staffing on the ambulance, we may be able to turn over that care to the advanced EMT or the EMT who maybe doesn't have as much training, but that patient fits within their scope of practice. And now that leaves a resource in the community to respond to those second unit calls and be available for, for a patient that maybe is a little bit more high acuity. Uh, there was about, I think it was three some days ago. Uh, we used this model three times. Um, in the, the span of 24 hours, there were three simultaneous calls where within five minutes we were dispatched to a second call. And we were able to use the staffing of both ambulances and the SUV to make sure that the paramedic went to the appropriate level of call, the appropriate call that was going to require those resources, but both patients ultimately received an ambulance and, and evaluation. So. And you're saying that's what you're calling flexible staffing model? Yep, the, the flex staffing. And it's made possible with the SUV? Yep, yeah. absolutely. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, if we have a call out in, say, um, the Cedar Crest community over on Highway 30 and 13, if all of our crew members aren't on the ambulance, there's no way to get that paramedic or, or another resource back into town so that they can, you know, stand by for the second unit. Um, whereas with this, we can go out and we can make that call and, and break up the crew or, or make that coverage possible. So. Uh, it's actually a model that is starting to catch on in Iowa. This is super popular on the East Coast. They've been doing it for years. They've had a paramedic shortage for about 10 years before we've experienced it. So they're pretty well versed in these operations um, and how they work. So as we look to the, the growing community, we know our, our needs are going to grow. So when we look at what training we can provide to our service members, um, currently we do pretty much all of our training out to the, the police department because we can't physically fit everybody in our training room. Um, and that really puts a damper on us doing community education. Uh, our goal is to start ramping up our CPR, Stop the Bleed courses, uh, as well as some of the other advanced courses that we can offer to, to businesses in the, the commun community, uh, which is oftentimes requiring us to go to them, move equipment, extra wear and tear on equipment, or finding an alternative spot for that training and education. Uh, as well as the addition of vehicles and equipment. Uh, you know, as our community grows, I like to say that we don't need three ambulances for response right now, but we need two. So when we have an ambulance that's down for more than a few hours for an oil change for, for long-term maintenance, uh, it really hampers on our ability to response. 
at the same point, that's where we start calling in on those relationships to Mechanicsville Stanwood, communicating what are your resources for the day. We're going to be down the truck. What's it going to look like if we have another call come in? And so that kind of gives us our strategic plan. So when you look at it, we really have our five pillars there. First and foremost, we want to make sure that we're providing good, high-quality care to our communities. We want to make sure that we are finding members to participate and that we are having a, a really a, an environment that people want to be a part of. Uh, make sure that we're being sustainable and utilizing um, city funds appropriately and for good projects. Make sure that we have continuity of operations. Should something happen, can we pick up and continue on? Um, and looking at what our staffing needs to be to, to continue that, as well as what it would look like for us to become a, a leader in training in the region, um, which, we, which we kind of already are. So with the, the care, we want to make sure that our clinical guidelines, so our protocols that are put in place by Dr. Carter, are consistent with best practices. We don't want to be practicing old medicine, but we also don't want to be doing something that could potentially bring harm to patients. We want to make sure that we're enforcing those good habits and that good care with education to our crews. Make sure that we have advanced level providers that are able to mentor um, our EMTs as well as other ALS providers to provide that high level of care and make sure that we're doing good quality improvement processes within our PCRs to make sure that we are providing the appropriate level of care for our community. Um, when we look at staffing, we want to make sure that we are not only finding new folks at a steady rate so that we can kind of continue to, to match our attrition, but we want to make sure that we're, we're rewarding and keeping those members that are, are seasoned and have been with us. Uh, they bring a lot of value through mentorship, with experience, with just kind of general EMS lore, you could call it. You know, it's, it's funny, they, they say in the EMS things come around about every six years, so you get rid of something and then in six years they're trying to sell it back to you. Um, we want to make sure that we have a culture that people want to be a part of um, and people that people want to, to be with. So, and again, kind of looking at our, our spaces and accommodations, one of the semi-unique um, recruitment tools we've used is we have a couple of members that come to the station and work from home from the station. Um, so they're, they're members, one's from Cedar Rapids, one's from Ely, and they'll come, they'll, they'll do their remote setup, but now they're in our community able to provide 911 service during the day, which is a time when we're notoriously short. So, and then, like I said, sustainability. We want to make sure that we're utilizing funds appropriately, that we are finding diverse revenue streams, whether that be um, patient revenues, fundraising, um, making sure that people understand our needs, that you know we, we do need those donations yearly to help sustain our service for equipment replacement and to manage the growth. Uh, anytime you're dealing with public safety, we know that the, the need far outpaces what you have in your reserves. So to, to approach that and, and secure that with fundraising has been huge the last four or five years. So and then make sure that not only are we able to continue to operate, but everybody understands what their role is and what their responsibilities are for the service. And finally, um, again, using that call data to build, run, or basically um, public education courses, stroke care. Why does it benefit you to call an ambulance when you're having chest pain versus saying, well, the ambulance is going to take six minutes to get to me if I throw my coat on really fast and drive 85 miles an hour to the hospital in St. Luke's, I can check in and register and then sit and wait 30 minutes for the cardiologist where they can call us and we show up. We can call and alert the ER um, at the time of contact that we may have a, a heart patient and that cardiologist is now waiting for you in the hospital. Um, not that anybody would do that. Um, but that's, that's the end of it. Uh, like I said, it's a big overview. Um, I do plan on being out in the community a little bit more this year, uh, next year, sharing our message, sharing what our goals are. What questions do you have for me? Uh, I don't have a question. Uh, first, I want to say thank you. Um, I've been involved in city government for 24 years now, in one way, shape, or form, and this is the best understanding of what you do that I've ever had, and I really appreciate it. And, um, you're to be commended on bringing this together, and I would highly recommend community education, as I know you've got plans, but boy, this is powerful. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's, you know, it, 
having the ability to stand up here and at least show the service overview and understand where we're coming from, I, I feel is a very powerful tool. Um, you know, we would we love it when we can get people to the station and talk about just how fortunate we are. Um, you know, when we start talking about equipment we've received through grants, things that we've been able to keep off of the you know off of the the coffers basically through good hard um, you know fundraising securing that equipment through alternative means, things like that. And I, I from personal experience, I would encourage one of the key pieces of education for some of our elderly folks, you know, the, the um, call 911, don't call your son or daughter first, no. because 911 will help you much more quickly. Yeah, well, so kind of along those lines, one of the metrics we're watching is when are we being involved in stroke symptoms? So if it's within four and a half hours, um, there's a good chance that we can take you to a local ER that can give you some medicine that will help break up that clot if it's a clot and, and have very little deficits. Uh, well, what we're finding through call review and metric review is a lot of times we're being called outside of that window is, Oh, I was a little weak I, and had a headache. I thought I'd give it a few hours. Well, at hour five, we can't do that anymore. And your best option is, as a hospital, you probably don't want to go to, but we're going to, to highly recommend regardless. So but things like that are, are what we want to watch. Well, and, and what strikes me when we get these reports, and I would echo Paul's sentiment, this is uh, far and away the most detailed that we've seen, and I do appreciate it, just the sheer volume that you folks accomplished. And even knowing it, I wouldn't have guessed that you're at nearly a thousand calls. So in 2017, we did 452. Yeah. So. And I think that's the biggest testament from being on the board for so long and just trying to work through. And it wasn't that long ago I was coming to you with conversations about um, survivability, yeah. not sustainability. Um, are we going to have a service in six months or a year from that standpoint, or do we need to look at different models or different options from that? And so I just want to publicly, you know, commend Jake and his work and the, the board's work on addressing some of those issues and getting us where we're at, that we truly survived through the pandemic and thrived through the, pand the pandemic with where it was at. Um, and through Jake's reputation and, and the, the services reputation, um, they are an identified respected resource in the area. And so kind of going back to Tom's question, he, they, they do get pulled further because the paramedic levels and things like that um, are lacking in other areas. Anamosa has been a, a heavy pull for us sometimes uh, rolling through there and it seems like we're going to different hospitals more frequently than we used to uh, and things like that. So it's it's good to be in a sustainable situation with reliable resources. Um, again, another, rep, another thing that we are blessed um, in <coughs> Mount Vernon to have that service, have his services available and the, the, the level of paramedic service that we have um, is amazing. So. And it's one thing to have three vehicles, and that's just writing checks, but to have three vehicles that, that you can staff, and the staffing growth, that's what yeah. strikes me, so, the staffing growth in the time that I've been on council. So I have to be very careful when I go to EMS association <laughs> meetings because we'll, we'll start going around the room and people will be talking about their crews at 8 and maybe 12, and then it gets to me in 31, 34, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. And then I get a bunch of glares. Um, so, so it, you know, it's a huge testament to the culture that's that our crew has been able to cultivate. Um, you know, we we are very education focused. We want people to have a reason to be there and want to be there, and uh, that's definitely been been the case. So, thank you for your very professional presentation. Thank you, take your asset to the community, and please pass on our thanks to all your 34, 31. Staff members, more than eight. Uh, yeah, more than eight. Uh, and the board, yeah. and the board too, for uh, taking it from a point of sustainability to a point where it's at now. Our, you know, just describe so, the of sustainability mm -hmm. now. Um, yeah. I would probably encourage you to also say your PowerPoint to maybe the sun and make sure you get all the details and get a whole breadth and depth of the story uh, for sure. Yeah, I know Nathan. I saw walk in has been been awesome about. Um, you know, sharing our stories when we've had great successes and, and sharing challenges at the same time. So we appreciate the sun and everything they've done to, to help get our name out there and, and make people aware that we do have an ambulance and it is their ambulance. Uh, 
and they should be pretty prideful of that. So, thank you. I think uh, this calls for a round of applause. Good call, Paul. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the court is <coughs> mayor, a couple of administrators. Um, I'm going to start with Craig on child care. Are you, yeah, speak a little bit about that. Get some speed on Yeah, uh, the Mount Vernon Lisbon Child Care um, Committee met a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we meet monthly, every four to six weeks. And uh, really, what this group has done is to ensure from a grassroots effort that we can count on high quality, well trained child care providers um, through augmenting their wages. And so this group has, uh, through grant and fundraising, distributed about $55,000 to um, Mount Vernon and Lisbon child care providers associated with the school districts. And their next step, of course, is to sustain that because providing bonuses or an extra couple of dollars an hour is wonderful. It's well received. Um, the child care providers are very, very grateful to receive this, uh, but it's not a one-shot deal. And so you have to continue in, the, in that process. Um, there are actually, though, two forks in this road. One road is this grassroots effort that has been going on for a couple of years now and to help provide some additional resources and funding. Uh, again, that's an annual thing to, to, to provide those resources. The second road is to have something more permanent uh, and to have child care uh, facility in Mount Vernon, Lisbon area that can house you know, 100 to 150 children before and after school care uh, appropriate certified kitchen, bathrooms, and so on. There are a lot of challenges with that, and in fact, now that we're getting to uh, about the year and a half or more anniversary of this group coming together on a grassroots basis, and now that we're beginning to have more long-term vision and view of child care in Mount Vernon and Lisbon, we are coming back <coughs> together on April 9th at Cornell College for a, a uh, large group meeting that will include members of the Lisbon City Council, members of the Lisbon School Board, members of Mount Vernon City Council, School Board. Um, the Iowa Women's Conference will help lead the meeting. Um, the mayor is going to help co-lead the meeting, or at least uh, be a, a, a visible presence at, at that meeting as well. And what our hope is, is that we will be able to <coughs> Um, provide a little bit of history of what we've done in the last couple of years and what do we need to do moving forward to ensure that the grassroots effort continues at the same time that we are thinking more long term. Is that what you're looking for? Mm -hmm. I should do it. Um, <laughs> is that enough? <laughs> Thanks, Craig, for arranging this uh, April 9th meeting. And, uh, well, John Harp, Greg Batenhorst, Tom Weasler, Chris, obviously, has been a huge, huge part of this, uh, and, and I've been uh, fortunate to attend the meetings as well. It's a lot of value with, some, with the three largest employers. And we want to um, invite all council members. And if, if, it, uh, if we need post-its, so we want them all by if they want to attend, if they're available to attend that night. And uh, the, the, the dynamics of having an official meeting are very brief. The idea is to have a discussion uh, with all the players and to get everyone up to speed equally on the process. And that's why, like, like I mentioned, all the invites to the Lisbon Council and the school board. And I want to make sure you're all on the way to you. And I'm speaking at the next Monday's school board open comment meeting, open comment part of the meeting, to extend an invitation to all of them to attend as well. And we'll get it set up. Nate, we're going to meet as a group in um, oh, probably about two weeks to finalize an agenda for this, but uh, we'll make it's, a, it's, it's April 9th, all pariah at Cornell, 6.30 until 8-ish. Okay. Once an agenda is, is put together, that's the sole purpose of this meeting in, in about 10 days, is to make sure that when we're getting a group together like this, that we have our you know, T's crossed and, and I's dotted. 
Thank you, Craig. Um, one item of sustainability. Um, we will probably be getting some uh, more rain barrels, so I need to talk to Elda about possibly uh, going to Cedar Rapids and picking up uh, a uh, couple dozen rain barrels. Uh, I think these may be coming from Big Grove uh, Brewery, the, the, the donation. So we'll probably distribute them at like Choc Choco Walk. Don't go there. No, no, Scott's eyes light. Yeah. light well, they were, up, so. Last time they were sent, they were brought to us by Pepsi. Pepsi. I was yeah. disappointed that they weren't brought because of Pepsi. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I've seen a lot of opportunities with bigger ones. <laughs> <laughs> the barrel will not come empty. <laughs> well, they chalked a walk. They're going to have to be empty. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I thought you were going to say you were going to bring more rain. <laughs> I want to see that no. rain. Now. All three are desirable. No. But, Maybe requesting more rain barrels to come in uh, either one of those days or uh, the cleanup day last weekend and last Saturday of April. Um, also, I've got in my garage about four dozen um, home energy kits. You can come up with some method of distributing them and so on, but um, those are things on sustainability. From the mayor's side, I did attend um, um, local leaders on the hill visiting uh, Capitol two Wednesdays ago. I uh, spoke to Cindy Golding and Charlie McClintock, and they will uh, visit with us uh, after the session uh, ends in another month or so. Uh, good conversation with them. It was a very busy day. And uh, tomorrow, um, there are different conversations about Cornell. I'm getting interviewed by someone from the Chronicle of Higher Education about uh, the relationship of a small town with a private college in it. So uh, got some um, those prepared for that interview tomorrow with uh, the Chronicle. And, um, I think that's all I had to talk about there. Any other council reports, comments from other meetings? Chris, you gave us an update about what you've got coming up. All this coalition, this is a follow up to Stephanie's issue okay. with regard to smoking, maybe smoking establishments, which may be a good point based upon what the legislature has been doing now with uh, possibly looking at making some changes with uh, CBD and all those items um, in that area. Um, you're doing IMMI, quarter staff appreciation on Friday of well, this week. Anything else yeah. to share? Anything else that needs to come before this council? Otherwise, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Who's interviewing you? I don't know the first thing, but uh, uh, I'll just go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Okay, now I gotta turn this off. Yeah.